Well, good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Doing well? I'm super excited to share the word of God with you today. Hopefully by now everyone has found and gotten into their fall routine. My family and I uh, are just now getting into a good routine and rhythm now that school is back in session for the kids. That means that almost every day the kids come back home with, uh, from school with artwork. Uh, usually it's just a piece of paper with a ton of scribbly lines on it. And so when they hand it over to me, they're like, do you like it? And uh, when they do that, I always make it seem like it's the greatest thing my eyes have ever seen. I'm like, I like it, Picasso. And then when they turn around, I just throw it away. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kidding, guys. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, we hang up their artwork onto the fridge because I think as their parents, specifically as their dad, it's important for them to know that I am always proud of them and pleased with them no matter what. And so sometimes this type of interaction uh, with my kids gets me thinking about our relationship to and with God. And so let me ask you this. Do you ever think about if God is pleased with you? Do you ever think about if God is pleased with you? See, I think this is a super important question. And we're going to be trying our best to answer that today as we're looking at our passage, which I believe does share exactly what it is that pleases God. And so this morning, we're continuing our sermon series through the book of Isaiah. And we're going to be looking specifically at Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 57, verse 15. And over the last few weeks, we've seen that one of the major themes in the book of Isaiah is something called the Messianic hope, which says that there will be one Messiah, one man that will come and serve as king, servant, and conqueror over the people of Israel. And so that is the hope that they have to look forward to. That's what they get to look forward to. And so over the last few weeks, we've been zeroing in on the first aspect of that, that he is king. And so our first uh, sermon of the series was uh, in Isaiah 6, and it showed that he is a holy king, right? And then last week, we saw that it's Isaiah 52, which uh, describes him as a saving king. And so today in our passage, we're going to be looking at uh, our passage that describes him as the king of the entire world. He's an international king. And I think it's important for us to know who God is so that we can know who we are in relation to God. And that will inevitably, inevitably, inevitably if I could speak, affect our relationship with everybody else, with others, right? And so as we will see today, our passages describe God's person, it describes first God's person, as well as the persons that God is pleased with. And so I'm not going to uh, like delay much further in spoiling you and spoiling the news of who it is that pleases God or what it is that pleases God, because it's actually the main thing that I want all of us walking away remembering today. And that is this, this simple, simple phrase that God the King is pleased with the humble. That's the main simple thing I want you walking away with today, that God the King is pleased with the humble. And so we're going to be dissecting this phrase um, and, and diving deeper into it so that we could understand it in the context of our passage today. So this is where we're going, all right? And so the first thing that we are confronted with in our passage is God the King. We are confronted with God's person, God the King, right? Uh, let's open up our Bibles. If you're already there, great. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1 and 2. We'll read the first portion of verse to up to that point and then turn back to 57. But let's start off uh, first, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. It says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where could you possibly build a house for me? And where would my resting place be? My hand made all these things and so they all came into being. This is the Lord's declaration. Now, let's stop there for a moment and go to 57.15. It says, for the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, says this, I live in a high and holy place and with the oppressed and lowly of spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart 
of the oppressed. See, in the entire book of Isaiah, but specifically here, we are confronted with God's person. And what God clearly establishes here as he speaks is that he is king. And so where is the realm of God's kingdom and how far does his dominion reach? Well, Isaiah 66 verse 1 through 2 clearly state that God is, is king of heaven and earth. It says, heaven is my throne, which symbolizes his royal power. And the earth is his footstool where he exercises his rule. And so since heaven is his throne and and the earth is his footstool, it's clear that his reign fills all of heaven and earth. And what that means is that God's reign and dominion isn't simply limited to being over Israel. It's not simply limited to Israel. He's the king above all nations. He transcends over and above ethnic lines and barriers between one another. He's the international king. This is confirmed where he says, where could you possibly build a house for me? Where could my resting place be, right? That means that there's not a single territory or nation or man-made temple or house that could ever contain our majestic God because his glory fills all of the earth. It fills all of the earth. So now that God's kingship is established here, God describes what type of king he is. And so he uses two attributes to describe himself, which theologians refer to as God's transcendence and his imminence. God's transcendence and imminence. Now, the terms transcendence and imminence aren't found in most versions of, uh, of the Bible, right? But they are two common words used in theology to help describe and designate two kinds of relationships between God and human beings. And so to say that God is transcendent. We'll focus on his transcendence for a second. To say that God is transcendent is to say that he's above us. He's beyond us. He's completely other than and independent of his creation. And so when you open up the Bible and read passages that describe him as being on high, living in heaven, or highly exalted, like chapter 57, verse 15 describe him, it means that God transcends over time and space. Now, what the Bible does not teach about God's uh, transcendence is that he uh, is so far above us that he uh, he cannot be known or identified in history. That is unbiblical. Now, let's focus on imminence. To say that God is imminent is to say that he's involved with us. He's present with us. He's near us, right? And so not only does God live in a high and holy place, but he also lives with the humble and lowly, as Isaiah 57, 15 describes. And so we're going to dive deeper into that in a moment. But first, we see that Isaiah prophesied earlier in in the book that, uh, that the promised Messiah King would be named Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? that shows his imminence with his creation. But what the Bible does not teach about God's imminence is is that he's so near us that he essentially is us, okay? That's also unbiblical. The Bible is clear that God is God and we are not. And so personally, as you view God and as you interact with God, is there an extreme that you lean more towards? Is there an extreme that you lean more towards, right? Like, is God so transcendent to you that he seems so far, distant, and removed from you, and he doesn't seem to care about you? Or, on the flip side, is he so imminent that Jesus is your homeboy, right? Jesus is your homeboy. He's not really God, right? He just, hey, he's someone that walked this planet a long time ago, has good morals, values, and if he was living today you'd hang out with him, you'd chill with him, right? Jesus is your homeboy. But see, if we view God in any of these extremes, it's best for us to go back to the word of God, to focus our hearts and minds exactly on what it is that God reveals himself to be in his word. See, because these two concepts, transcendence and imminence, when they relate to God, when they describe God, they are actually linked. 
and they come together and they cannot be separated. They are necessary implications of one another. For example, the owner of the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, Josh Harris, just became the new owner of the Washington Commanders over the summer. And it was very impressive to see that during his uh, first preseason game as owner, he decided not to sit in uh, his owner's box suite all high and mighty, but instead chose to sit in regular seats uh, in the stands with the fans the entire game. So he was high-fiving fans and having a ton of fun with them the entire game. And he said that he did this because he it reminded him of when he was a young fan of the team growing up, going to games with family and friends. Now, this is not what the fan base has been used to. Washington's previous owner was so concerned and, and primarily only cared about uh, making money and completely didn't care about the fan base at all. He isolated the fan base instead, right? And so it's really nice to see someone who is as prestigious as it is to be an NFL owner on a class of their own, right, seem so down to earth with the fans. And so Josh Harris has said that his top priorities are winning on the field and winning the fan base back. And so guys, 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 I am drinking the Kool-Aid on trusting the process, which I know makes many of you Sixers fans super sick to the stomach hearing that phrase. But I'm trusting the process, baby. Let's go, right? Let's go. Now listen, I know that this is not a clear, like perfect analogy of God's transcendence and imminence. I am by no means comparing Josh Harris to God, okay? I'm not trying to get struck down by lightning in the pulpit here, to, here today, all right? But what I'm trying to demonstrate is that transcendence and imminence are really easy to separate from each other, especially when we're de describing sinful human beings, right? But when they come together and when they're linked, they actually paint a beautiful picture. And that's what we see throughout the entire book of Isaiah, a beautiful picture of God's person, that he is king and how he interacts with his creation. He is both the transcendent and imminent king of heaven and earth. Amen? See, when God is both transcendent and imminent, exactly as he's revealed himself through his word, and not just one or the other, it not only paints a beautiful picture of God, but it also helps us grow in our love for him. You know why? Because God's transcendence and imminence is good news for us. It's good news. It's good news that he is transcendent and that he is great and highly exalted because that compels our, our obedience, our fear and reverence towards him. And it's also good news that he is imminent because that evokes our gratitude, joy, and amazement for him. And so we need, we need to have a good and healthy balance of all of those feelings as we approach our holy God in worship. And so the fact that God is both transcendent and imminent was a mind-boggling concept for many back in that day. And it's also a mind-boggling concept for many people today. But when we see it as God has revealed himself to be in his word, it paints a beautiful picture of God, the king, of his person, and it helps us grow in our love for him. And so far in our passage, we've seen what this passage says in relation to God's person. He is God, the king. Now we're going to shift our focus to the persons that God is pleased to be present with and dwell with. This passage describes what type and what kind of persons that God is pleased with and looks favorably at. And what we see is that it's not just any type of person, which leads us to our second point, that God the King is pleased with the humble. He is pleased with the humble. Let's go back to Isaiah 66. Verse 2, we're going to read the second portion of it. Isaiah 66, verse 2, the second portion of it. It says, this is the Lord's declaration. I will look favorably on this kind of person, one who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. And then go back to 57, 15, the second portion of it. It says, I live in a high and holy 
place, but not just there, right? And with the oppressed and lowly of spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the oppressed. What we see here is that the king is pleased with the humble. He looks favorably at them. One Bible commentator says that it's only the humble that can secure the gaze of the great creator. God associates himself with the one who's submissive, lowly in spirit, one who is broken, crushed, oppressed, and who trembles at his word, which all of these seem to point back to the major characteristic of humility. See, the king of the universe identifies with the humble and lowly. And not only does he esteem this type of person, but he also chooses and desires to be present with them and dwell with the ones who humble themselves before God and others. And since God's presence and favor is what our hearts long for, we want God to be pleased with us, right? Therefore, we need to pursue humility. We need to pursue humility. So then, how can one uh, become humble? How can one become humble? Well, we must first understand what the Bible describes about humility. And what might be helpful first is to start off with what humility is not. Uh, there are so many common misconceptions of what humility is, it, it is especially in our culture. For example, um, we like to describe people as having, you know, some sort of self-esteem, right? So either it's high self-esteem or low self-esteem, right? And so the extremes of those is being super prideful, right? Or self-deprecating, which is like, I am a terrible person, right? And so, um, so those are the extremes, right? And usually when we're looking at that, that spectrum, we tend to believe that the self-deprecating person is more of the humble person, obviously, than a person that is prideful. But believe it or not, these two extremes aren't that much different from each other. They are actually two sides of the same coin. How? It's because both of those extremes are focused with the self, are focused on the ego. Pride isn't the only thing that is self-absorbed. Self-deprecation can be a declaration of look at me just as much as pride is. But they just take a different route to get to the same destination, which is self-absorption, self-obsession, and selfishness. And it's clear that all of humanity is selfish because we are all sinners. But thankfully, God has provided a solution to this self-esteem spectrum. And what he doesn't tell us is uh, if those that are prideful and have high self-esteem to lower it, right? He doesn't say that. Or he doesn't tell the ones that are self-deprecating and have low self-esteem to raise it up a little bit, have higher self-esteem. No, he says that, hum uh, that humility is the solution. And the Bible's definition of humility is far different than our culture's is. And so author C.S. Lewis uh, helps summarize the Bible's definition of humility. And he has a fantastic quote. He says this. He says that the essence of humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. I'll repeat it. The essence of humility is not thinking more of myself. I'm self-deprecating, have low self-esteem, think more of myself. And it's not thinking less of myself. I'm very prideful. I need to think less of myself. No, it is thinking of myself less. And so humility isn't focused on the self-esteem at all, nor the ego at all. It's not primarily focused on self at all. Humility is others focused. Humility is others focused. So then how can one become humble before God and others? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us great practical insight in Philippians chapter 2. And so we're going to focus our mindset on Philippians chapter 2. And uh, he tells us a couple things that are super helpful. The first thing he tells us is to seek unity. We need to seek unity. And we see this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And so it says, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, 
and intent on one purpose. See, Paul is calling us to be united and to live in harmony with others. But unity is a tough thing to obtain at times due to divisions, gossip, quarrels. And it's not something that, that uh, just happens on its own. Instead, we need to seek it out at all costs. We need to seek it out at all costs because we glorify and exalt Christ through that unity. All right? And so the world sees Christians, believers from different backgrounds and different walks of life, all coming together, united in one purpose and having one mindset. And that is to worship and glorify the international king, the king of the entire world named Jesus. Amen? And so unity and harmony are beautiful things that we need to seek out at all costs. For example, way before I was a pastor, I was actually an MBA center. Uh, I don't know why that didn't, why are you laughing? I didn't know, I, I don't know why it didn't happen, you know, and work out, maybe it was my jump shot. Some of you, I know we're laughing because you're like, yeah, you're pretty short, bro. Um, <laughs> but actually, I was a musician, and um, I, I taught music, I recorded music, toured with bands, even led worship, all that stuff. That's a story for another day. But one day, I was actually contracted out by a uh, friend who was a recording artist in New York City. And my friend actually um, hired this young drummer from Berkeley Music School that had just finished his first year at Berkeley Music School to be a part of the band. Now, if you don't know anything about Berkeley Music School, it's one of the best music schools in the entire nation. It's fantastic. And so this drummer was really, really talented. And the whole band was really talented. And uh, we were all paid to um, learn the music in advance. But this drummer, being so young, decided that he didn't need to practice. And so he pulled the Allen Iverson. Practice? You talking about practice, right? And so he pulled out the Allen Iverson and decided to just outshine everyone and do his own thing. And because he decided to be the star of the show rather than just being a part of the band, it affected all of us. And we all sounded terribly. So instead of sounding like a band that was united and sounded beautifully, we sounded really bad because we were not united. And so Paul similarly urges the church to not be comprised of people that are trying to be the stars of the show, but instead that we would seek unity at all costs. Because it's a beautiful thing when believers are united on one accord. We exalt and glorify Christ's name rather than bringing shame to his name. And so seeking unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ is a beautiful thing that we need to seek out at all costs. At the same time, it's a wonderful sign of humility. But that's not the only thing he tells us. He continues in this passage, and he tells us, he says, to check your ambitions. Check your ambitions. Look at verse 3 and 4 of Philippians 2. He continues on saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility Consider others as more important than yourselves. It's literally defining humility right here. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. See, we all have ambitions. All of us have ambitions. But what the Bible differentiates is between godly ambition and selfish ambition. And what it comes down to is the motivations of the heart behind the ambitious drives our motivations. And so what motivates you? Why do you work so hard? For example, Elon Musk is known as one of the most ambitious and innovative people in the entire world, so much so that the guy wants to colonize Mars. And I think that's almost as innovative as his son's name, which actually I don't think I've found anyone that actually knows how to pronounce it correctly. Um, and 500 bucks goes out to the person that can do that without Googling it. Right? Uh, but he's, he's so ambitious. But no matter how ambitious he is, he's pretty upfront about what his motivations are. I mean, he's written books about it. And it's all about making money and being rich and being in power and control. Because by making money, you have power and control, right? 
Now, there is nothing wrong with making money and providing for your family. But if your goals and ambitions are solely motivated to be to become rich and to have power and control, then be careful because you have a really good chance of using people and running over people just to get what you want. But is that really the type of ambition that God is calling us to have? Is that really the ambition that God is calling us to have? And so as you're analyzing yourself, ask yourself this. This is an important question. How do your goals and ambitions allow you to serve God and others as well as bring you joy? Not just how do they bring you joy and happiness, right? How do your goals and ambitions allow you to serve God and others as well as bring you joy? Put some thought into that. Think about it because it may be a very tough question for many of us to answer. But I do believe that it applies to all of us, especially in the context of life outside of the church, like work and, and, and community and so forth. How do your goals and ambitions at work or wherever allow you to serve God and others as well as bring you joy? See, godly ambition helps us to work hard to make a godly impact on others, while selfish ambition is solely motivated to seeking out its and so the Bible says, check your ambition. But that's not the only thing. The final and most important thing that Paul urges us to do, that he urges the church to do, is to follow the example of Jesus. Follow the example of Jesus. And we see this in verse 5 through 11. It says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every single name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See Paul tells us to look to Jesus for he's our example. Jesus the king of the entire universe humbled himself by emptying himself becoming a servant and by perfectly obeying God the Father all the way to the cross to satisfy God's wrath on sin, and he reconciled us back to God the Father. It's only the humiliation of Jesus that saves us. It's only the humiliation that, of Jesus that saves us. The only reason we can be pleasing, bef uh, ple uh, pleasing before God is through the humiliation of Jesus. What Jesus accomplished in his life and death on our behalf is what makes us pleasing before God. God. And so our pursuit for humility isn't to earn his acceptance, favor, and pleasure, but it's to humbly obey and follow his perfect example for us. And so that's why Paul says to adopt the same attitude, have the same mindset of Jesus. This is what we do as disciples of Jesus. We follow his example. We do what he does. For example, my, my, my kids do copy everything that I do. Right. And so if I'm uh, screaming and clapping at the TV while I'm watching sports, they'll be in the other room. They'll drop everything and come over and start clapping and screaming at the TV, too. They're like, if that is doing it, then I should be doing it, too. And so similar, similarly, Paul is telling the church to have the same mindset of Jesus. He, he says, if Jesus was humble, then you should be, too. If Jesus was others focused, then you should be, too. And so we follow the example of Jesus. We look to Jesus as our example because there's true power that happens when, when we do that. He humbles us. He transforms our hearts when we're reminded of his grace for us. and We can extend that towards others. And so this is a broad overview of what the Bible teaches about humility. And it's a beautiful thing that we need to strive for. And so if you want to live a life where God is pleased with you, only possible through the humiliation of Jesus and placing our faith in the humble king. 
And that's what Isaiah pointed to. He pointed to this promised Messiah king that would come and humble himself to accomplish our salvation. And what he pointed to was Jesus Christ. Amen? So to recap what we've learned this morning, we've seen that God the king is pleased with the humble. And we learned that he's a transcendent and imminent king. And this king looks favorably at and is pleased with the humble and lowly. So therefore, we should pursue humility. Not to earn God's acceptance, favor, and pleasure, but to humbly and obedient, uh, and to uh, obey his humble example for us. And what we learned is humility, it's not primarily focused on the self. Instead, it is others focused. And we humble ourselves by seeking unity, checking our ambitions, and by following the example of Jesus Christ. Why is this important? Why is this so important? Why should we pursue humility? It's not just because we're commanded to, but ultimately it's because humility frees us from ourselves to live for God the King and his kingdom. It frees us from ourselves to live for God the King and his kingdom. Humility is others focused. And so God has freed us from ourselves and from our preferences so that we could live for, to serve God and serve others. We can live for God the King and his kingdom. That means that we can do kingdom work, which is to preach and share the gospel to every nation, tongue, and tribe, showing them that there is a king of the entire world that loves them, this universal and international king. His name is Jesus. And so not only are we free from ourselves, but we're also free from others' uh, others' opinions about us. We're free from trying to please others because we can rest assured that the king of the entire universe is pleased to dwell and be present with us only through the mediation of Christ. And that is good news. That is good news. And so we can wholeheartedly focus on serving and caring for others. And so my challenge to you is to think about what your next step will be in humbly serving God and others. What will your next step be in humbly serving God and others? Think about it, pray about it, and then do it. 